So for the confidence interval for beta 1, that's simple, exactly as always. It's going to be the observed value of beta 1 from the model itself, and then times some z value, in this case is 95%, so it's 1.96. And then is the standard error of beta 1 that comes from the model output as well. So in this case, from the unit, beta 1 is point, neg negative 0 0.2971. And its standard error in the next column of the output is 0 0.05485. So a 95% confidence interval for beta 1 is going to be simply by the formula beta 1 as observed, beta 1 hat minus 1.96 times the standard error. And the same with a plus in the middle, it comes to negative 0.4 and negative 0.189. So if I want the confidence interval for a change in the odds for a k-fold increase in area, then what remember we said was it's going to be 2 to the power of beta, so 2 to the power of the confidence interval we have, and so it is essentially 2 to the power the confidence interval I looked at earlier, it gives me the numbers as 0 0.755 and 0 0.8756. So if I increase the area by twofold, then the odds of survival, the confidence interval is 0 0.755 to 0 0.876. If I go the other way around, then I take it as 0.5 to the power. If I halve the area, it's 0.5 to the power. And I can see now that the probability or the odds of extinction have actually increased 1.32 to 1.14. So you can see how the, because of this, this is a 0.5 to the power, the uh, actual interval is reversed in direction. So I need to write this 1.14 to 1.32. Model assessment for binary responses. Now the residual here is the rate observed minus the fitted. In the case of logistic regression, when the data or the observed values essentially are 0 or 1, and the fitted values are estimates of pi i, which lie between 0 and 1. So the plotting of residuals, raw residuals as we see it, which is essentially the observed minus expected. In this case, the observed is going to be either 0 or 1, and the expected is simply pi i, which lies between 0 and 1. You can see what will happen is, you will get two parallel lines. Depending on whether it's a 0 or 1 here, it's going to be either minus pi or 1 minus pi, either way. So you're going to get two parallel lines, you can try that yourself. And so this isn't acceptable or anything useful for from a residual point of view. And in fact, you, can, you cannot also detect any outliers because the numbers all lie on the two straight parallel lines. So there are many other ways of doing this. As far as the residual analysis here goes, we can take a look at two similar types of residuals, Pearson residuals and deviance residuals. We look at peers and residuals over here. So when you take a look at peers and residuals, what it is is essentially y i minus m i pi i. So in this case, with the binomial response, it's going to be y i is the observed number of successes, and m i pi i observed here is the expected number of successes, and of course. Over bot at the bottom here, we're going to have the standard deviation, which is the square root of, square root of variance. If I have Bernoulli data, of course, the MI becomes 1. Nothing else changes here. So here, the piece of the syllables will have mean 0 and standard deviation of 1. And I can plot them. So uh, we can extract these and uh, Put them in the data file, data data uh, structure here, data frame. So we've got residuals here from the object, the linear model object, and we've said that the type is Pearson. And I've also got the fitted values, and I've got in this case the empirical proportions, and the fitted values, and the Pearson residuals all together. 
So the empirical proportions should be close to the fitted values. And the residuals is what I've got there. So I can plot these out in the usual way. So I've got a plot of the piece of residuals against the fitted values. And as usual, I expect to have a reasonably random plot over here that lies essentially between a band in, the, in a band here, which is fine, it's between negative 1.5 to 1.5. So if I use our usual rule that anything beyond about 2 or 2.5, and maybe in some cases 3, is maybe an outlier here, you can find there really are no outliers in this particular model. I can look at the histogram of residuals as well. And the histogram should be pretty close to normal. It's not too bad over here in this case. As we saw earlier, we can take a look at Deven's good, goodness of fit or a Deven's hypothesis test instead. So H0 is the fitted model is not better than the null model, and H1 is the fitted model is better. The difference in deviance or the drop in deviance compares the likelihood of the two particular models, of the specified model to the null model here. And under the, the null hypothesis, the drop in deviance here or the difference in deviance is essentially is approximately a chi squared distribution where the degrees of freedom is n minus p in this case. n is the number of observations and p is the number of parameters fitted to the model. And of course if the difference is larger then we have uh, uh, the p value in this case for the chi squared will become better, will become small. So for the deviance test in this case, as before, we can take a look at the difference in deviance and you'll find here the null deviance and the residual deviance both given to us. So the residual deviance is going to be lower than the null, null deviance. If you take a look at the differences between those, the null minus the actual deviance here, so you can see what's going on. You will find here that uh, the null deviance is higher than the residual deviance. The difference is about 33 odd here. You can check to look at the numbers here. And the degrees of freedom here, the difference is just one here. This is the chi squared one distribution we're looking at. The number here is about 33, so the chi squared one will look a bit like this over here, very, very steep this way. And 33 is about here, so this has a very low p value over here somewhere, which means we have very strong evidence here against the null hypothesis. In other words, we conclude the fitted model is better, and that the area here certainly does affect the odds of extinction. Common limitations of regression here, logistic regression, logistic regression in particular, is that uh, the coefficients are estimated using maximum likelihood estimation. This requires iteration because the equations are very non-linear, and there are very many other method, many methods of actually solving the equations here. One is Fisher scoring or Newton Raphson or some other methods called gradient methods here. The problem is that uh, the uh, the algorithm doesn't converge to a solution many times because of the very complex likelihood function itself. So if you have a large number of explanatory variables, you'll find that the models don't converge, and, uh, and that uh, in particular the world statistic is very, very conservative. And so the type 2 error has a higher chance, or increased chance, of type 2 error here. And also, if there is high correlation between two variables, you'll find the standard errors increase. You'll find this often when you look at models of this kind, and they seem to fit okay, but if you look at the standard errors, you'll find they're very, very large, in sometimes in thousands, and that should certainly alert you to a problem somewhere in the model. You'll find if the model doesn't converge, and then in the model e e equation itself, you can put in and the maximum number of iterations as large as a hundred or something, because otherwise it takes only about ten or so as the default. And after ten iterations, the algorithm doesn't converge; it essentially stops. But you can force it to actually carry on further by setting the maximum iterations as a larger number here. The other problem, of course, as we saw earlier, you'll find also in the modeling is that if any of the uh, cells has zero counts in the cross-simulation, if you're looking at, for example, the uh, um, 
model with uh, where you have zero counts, for example, nothing in the model, in the data at all corresponding to either the success or the failures, then you can't fit that model because there is no data corresponding to some of the variables. And of course, also this works very, very, in the case of uh, interactions, it's a common problem that you have interactions between two variables where there's no data in some of the combination of the levels here. When we have complete separation of data, in other words, one variable perfectly predicts successes or failures. So, for example, if we do take a look at males, females versus survival, and if all the males survive and all the females don't survive, then you've got perfect separation. So, you can't actually fit the model at all here. All you have is all the males survive with probability 1, all the females don't survive with probability 1. And so, there you have complete separation of data, and then you, your models just won't fit. Dispersion parameter you'll find in the model, it will tell you that for the binomial family has been taken to be 1. Now this dispersion parameter is a problem or is actually can be used for diagnostics of the model. So for the Gaussian regression, this parameter simply is the mean square error or the square of the residual tended error. For logistic regression, what do you think this is? Well, we'll see this later in the next few lectures. But essentially, this is the idea we saw earlier. That the mean of the binomial distribution is P, and the variance is, for the Bernoulli, this is P1 minus P here. So the mean and the variance have this fixed ratio of 1 minus P. If that doesn't hold, if the variance is larger than this p1 minus p idea for the data that we have, and then the binomial distribution is inappropriate, or the Bernoulli model is inappropriate, and in this case, the dispersion is larger than 1. You've got more dispersion here than is expected under a Bernoulli or binomial model, and that needs to be adjusted in some ways. In that case, we can't simply fit a binomial model anymore. Conditional regression, I won't say too much more about, but you'll see this in the labs this week. So we have here, when the response variable is Bernoulli or binomial, and the observations are matched or finally stratified to control for nuisance parameters. So the parameters there that are in the model, which is essentially make a mess of the model. In this case, the, the problem is that the parameters aren't perfectly matched for the individuals. So you might find that if you look at males and females, and you look at height, then the males are all much taller than the females. So then height can't be used in the model along with males and females. In that case, you separate the, the, the model out. In other words, you put a separate model for males and a separate model for females. Also, you might find that in some medical trials, that the age of the individuals, age of males and females, isn't perfectly matched or closely matched. In that case, you can't fit a model using age because the age of females is quite different from that of males. In that case, again, you will stratify the model and fit a different model for males and a different for females. As it says here, there are a few measured variables such as age don't match up. But there may be unmeasured variables, for example, like twins. So you might actually try and match age and weight for the subjects. But in twin, some twin studies, where you watch twins that are perfectly matched in many other ways, you don't have to worry about it. In this case, of course, the matching is by unmeasured variables over here. That's all that's happening here. That's enough for this week. Uh, as I said earlier, you'll actually look at this in the uh, lab this week. But all we're doing over here in conditional regression is controlling have a con control variable here, which stratifies the model in two different levels by different levels of the categorical variables this what that is created over here. You might have in this case for example a dummy variable that's for age for age one and age two and three different models for that. Alright, here from that. Thank you. Bye.